Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. begins in the middle of a discussion about carbon Pesach, which was brought on Shabbos. The Gemara is trying to bring a proof from our discussion about saving Sfarim on Shabbos. The Gemara is going to try to figure out what that proof was. Then the Gemara will discuss a Mavim Mephosh, which was mentioned in our Mishnah. What's a Mavim Mephosh? What's an Enim Mephosh? We'll try to figure that out. Then we'll have another Mishnah, which will discuss saving food from a fire on Shabbos. The Gemara will explain what the Xer is. The Gemara will see how it applies to a case of a broken barrel of wine. And then the Gemara will go off into other subjects, such as, are you allowed to play tricks in order to avoid a Isr der Abanon on Shabbos? Are you allowed to save different types of bread? How do you actually deal with bread that's being baked when Shabbos begins? And what are some things which we need to do in order to prepare for Shabbos? So let's begin the daf. The daf is trying to bring a proof from our case where we said that you're allowed to save and save for Torah on Shabbos from a fire. We're trying to prove from there about a carbon Pesach which was shechted on Shabbos because Erev Pesach fell out on Shabbos. What are you allowed to do with that? So... We're going to have four versions of what the proof is. The Gemara so far, at this point, is understanding that the issue is that the skin of the carbon, and possibly the carbon itself, are muktzah until the Shabbos is over. There's nothing you can do with it. So, that was a machlokis between Rabbi Shmuel, the son of Yechon and Mabrek, who said you're allowed to move it. And he actually, he even says you're allowed to skin it all the way. And the Rabbanon who say that you're not allowed to move it, it's muktzah. So the Gemara said that Rabbi Shmuel brought a proof from our Gemara where you're allowed to save a Sevatar from a fire. So the Gemara says, well, what kind of proof is that? We're going to reject that proof right away. That can't be what his proof was because the Sevatar being saved from the fire is not muktzah. The skin is muktzah and the flesh of the skin is muktzah. So how could you prove anything from that? So the Gemara says, no, the proof is not from saving the Sefer Torah. The proof is from saving the Sefer Torah, which is in a bag with money in the bag. And you see that you're allowed to save, you're allowed to move the money which is in the bag. In order to save the Sefer Torah, you should be allowed to move the animal, even though the skin is muktza. So the Gemara says, this also makes no sense. The flesh is also muktza. You can't eat the flesh until, pe- until Shabbos is over, until Pesach begins. So that's mukta. That has nothing to do with this. In the case of the money, yeah, the money is mukta, but the bag is holding the money and the Sefer Torah. So it's called a Bustles of Dover HaMutter Verha Aser. And the Sefer Torah is obviously more important, and therefore you're allowed to move it. So that has nothing to do with this. So the Gemara says, fine, you're right. No, our proof is from something else. The proof is from the fact that let's say I have a Sefer Torah, and it's in the path of a fire. I'm allowed to go bring a bag and use it to put the Sefer Torah into the bag in order to save that. I need the bag to save the Sefer Torah. I'm allowed to go bring a bag. Now, I'm allowed to even go bring a bag that has money in it. So when I'm bringing the bag, the bag is totally mukta. The only thing that's in it is money. I'm later going to put the Torah into it. Ah, so if that's the situation, so then I'm allowed to move the mukta money without a Sefer Torah in it in order to get to save the Sefer Torah. I should also then be allowed to move this carbon, um, which is mukta now, for the sake of Hashem. It's a covered Shemayim. I don't want it to spoil. I don't want it to rot. I don't want it to be lying there like a novella. So the Gemara says, that's a very nice proof, but whoever told you this halach was true? How do you know that you're allowed to go bring a bag with money in it? In order to put the Sefer Torah into that, who said that? Maybe you want to learn from the fact that if the money's already in the bag with the Sefer Torah, you're allowed to. But you want to bring a proof from there that you're allowed to go bring a bag. Who said you're allowed to do that? You, the reason why you're allowed to save the Sefer Torah with money already in its bag is because by the time you start emptying out the money, if we require you to take the money out, in the meantime, the Sefer Torah might burn. So we say you don't have to take the money out, but go bring a bag with money in while you're bringing the bag. Drop out the money. What's the problem? So the Gemara says, okay, you're right. We have no source of that. Halacha is true. Therefore, we're going to go back to our first version, our first understanding of what this machlokas is all about and what this proof is, which we saw on Daf Kof Tezayin yesterday. It's not about mukta. It's about skinning the animal. According to Bishmo, you're allowed to skin the animal all the way down. And according to the Chachamim, you're not. And the proof is... From the fact that you're allowed to move the mukta money l'shem shemayim, and we asked the question then, how could you prove from mukta to doing a malacha of skinning? Mukta is a durabanan, malacha uh, skinning is a iser dairaisa. The answer is that you're skinning it in a way which is not also because you don't intend to use the skin; you just intend to throw it out. So you're just trying to get it off. So it's not a; it's a tavar shein miskavin, or it should be malacha tzicha legufa, but. 
the Gemara seems to refer to it as in a miskavin because the Gemara asks, but it's a psikoresha. It's for sure going to happen. You're for sure skinning the skin off. There's no way that you say, I'm not taking the skin off. So the Gemara says, we're re- referring to a situation in which it's there abundant anyway, because you take it off of the shino, you take it off in strips so that it's unusable. It couldn't possibly be used. Therefore, it's only if it's abundant, therefore we're going to try to prove from the fact that you're allowed to move the mukta in order to save the safer tire that you're allowed to skin the animal in order to save the animal itself from either spoiling or being in a place of disgrace. Okay, that ends that subject. Now the Gemara goes back to the Mishnah, where we saw a discussion of a Mavi Mufolish and Mavi Sha'ina Mufolish. It's been a between the Rabbanan and Ben Seira. According to uh, the Rabbanan, you're only allowed to save the Sefer Torah into a Mavoi. Uh, you're even, you're only allowed to save it into a Mavoi Sha'ina Mufolish, which is a closed Mavoi. And according to Ben Seira, you're allowed to save it even into an open Mavi. The Gemara wants to know what is this closed Mavi, what is this open Mavi, what are you referring to? And the Gemara is going to try three attempts in order to figure this out. So, by way of introduction, a Mavi is a side street. Now, there could be two types of side streets, just like we have in our days. There could be side streets that one can pass through. One can go all the way through the street, go in one end, and out the other side. It has two sides, but it's open on two ends. Or there could be one which is a cul de sac, which is closed on three sides. Now, they theirs were closed all the way around, there weren't spaces between the houses. So, you can have one with three walls, and you can have one with two walls where you pass straight through. It has two openings on either end. Now, what is the status of this Mavoi? It's not really Rosh Hashanah, therefore you should be able to carry there. However, because it's close to Rosh Hashanah, it runs into Rosh Hashanah, it connects to Rosh Hashanah on one or two ends, you need some kind of sign, you need some kind of simon to mark it off, to show that it's not Rosh Hashanah. Then you'll be allowed to carry it there if, of course, you make an Erev Chateris and... Uh, do other things. So, the Gemara wants to know, well, how do you set this off from Rosh Hashanah? How do you mark this off to be a closed Mavoy? A Mavoy Mavoy is an open Mavoy. A Mavoy She'ena Mavoy is a closed Mavoy. You're allowed to carry into the closed Mavoy if it's properly set up. So, the Gemara wants to know, what are we referring to here when we say that to save a safe you're allowed to carry it into an open or a closed Mavoy. So, the Gemara, the first attempt is as follows. Is Rav Chizda. Rav Chizda says the open mavoi is where it's three sides, and you only have one side post on the wall next to the opening, right? So it's open, it's closed on three sides, it's a cul-de-sac, and there's one opening leading into Rosh Hashanah. The only sign, the only indicator that Rosh Hashanah stops or starts here is you have one side post, one lechi. That's called an open mavoi. And a closed Mavi is if there's two lechis. There's a side post on both sides of the opening into Rosh Hashanah. Now, what is this Machlokas about? Both the Rabbanon and Ben Mseira hold like the opinion of Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar holds that you need to have two side posts in order to make it a kosher Mavi for carrying. Here, the Machlokas is, in order to save a safer terror, you have to have a proper Mavi that you're allowed to carry in. According to Ben Seira, even if you have one which is slightly less than a proper Mavi, it only has one side post, doesn't have two, you're still allowed to save the Sefer Torah into there. So the Gemara challenges this. It is um, Rabbah who says that this can be, and there's two problems with this. First of all, if it has one side post, you can't tell me it's an open Mavi. Rabbi Eliezer wants to have extra things. He wants to have a side post on both sides of the opening. But if there's only one, he'll agree. It's not called an open mavoi. It's not open to a Shazer Rabbim. You do have a sign there. You do have something. That's problem number one. Problem number two is, is according to the Rabbanon, that you're carrying the Sefer Torah into a closed mavoi. It means you have two side posts. So you should be allowed to save even food into there. You're allowed to carry into there. What's the problem? So the Gemara Rabba therefore, has his own solution. He says, we're not talking about a cul-de-sac. We are talking about a through street. It only has walls on either side. It's open on two ends. Now, what is a closed mavoi where you have two side posts on each end, on each opening? Open mavoi is where you have only one side post on each opening. And this is going with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda and Hilchas Mavoi, who says that when you have two openings in the mavoi, you can drive straight through, you need to have, in order to close it off, you need to have either two lechis for each opening or a lechi and a crossbeam for each opening. So over here we're saying that According to Bem it's enough to have just one lechi because you're, there's a special leniency to save a safer terror from a fire. And according to the Rabbanon, no, you have to have 
to the regular amount. So Abaye says, well, then you didn't answer your second question. I understand why you're calling it a Mavim of Foolish, why it's an open Mavim. But in your second question that you asked, that according to the Rabbanon, that this is a regular fixed Mavim, and we're going in Rabbi Huda's opinion, that this is still a regular fixed Mavim if you have two side beams. So then again, why am I only allowed to save a Sefer Torah into there? I should be allowed to save regular food into there. So therefore, we have a third shot, and this is Ravashi. And Ravashi says, no, we're referring to a three-walled Mavoy, it's a cul-de-sac. And an open Mavoy is one that has no beams, it's just open. And a closed Mavoy is one that has one beam. And this is even in Rabbi Eliezer's opinion that you need to have two beams. This is what you have. So closed means that you have one beam. We're calling it closed because it does have one beam. Rabbi Eliezer would prefer two, but closed, it's still called closed if it has one. And the Chiddush here is, is that in order to save a Sefer Torah, it's, it's enough that you have only one beam. Even though normally, or to save food or something like that, Rabbi Eliezer would require two beams, two side posts. Here it's enough to have just one. Now, according to Bim Seder, it's enough even if you have none. And uh, that is what the Mishnah is teaching me, and that is this Machlokas. Okay, that is the end of that discussion. Now we get to the next Mishnah. This Mishnah is talking about saving food in Shabbos. We're no longer discussing saving Sifrei Torah, Dorem Shabbat Dush. We're just saving food. So how much food are you allowed to save? The Mishnah starts off and says you're allowed to save enough food for three meals. And why three meals? Because, because Shabbos requires three meals. And so now we have a Machlokas, Rabbi Yaisi, and the Tanakam. According to Rabbi Yaisi, you're allowed to save three meals at any point of Shabbos. Since Shabbos needs three meals, you can save three meals. According to the Tanakam, you're only allowed to save enough food for the amount of meals which you have left to eat. If you already ate one meal, you can only save two. If you already ate two meals, you can only save for one. Okay, now the Gemara asks right away. I don't understand what the problem is over here. If you're saving food, obviously you're saving it into a place with an Erev. There's no heter to save it into a non-Erev area. So you're saving food into a place with an Erev. So what's the problem? Why can't you just save whatever you want? You carry out whatever you want. So now the Gemara will explain what the is. The Gemara says, because it's a situation where you stand to lose a lot of money, because there's a fire in your house, so we're afraid that people would be very upset, they'd lose their head, and if we allow them to do whatever they want, they'll end up putting the fire out. Therefore, we restrict them from what they're allowed to save, in order that they should remember that it's Shabbos and they can't put the fire out. They're only allowed to save a minimum amount. So Abayah says, if that's true, then you should have a similar... You That must be the explanation to a similar case, where a barrel of wine broke. They used to keep him on the roof. So if a guy's barrel smashed, so he wants to save his wine, he's losing his money. So the halacha there is that he's allowed to bring along another kli and put it under the barrel in order to try to save the wine. However, he's not allowed to manually save the wine. I mean, he can't take a kli and try to grab this spilling wine out of the air, scoop it up from the roof, or catch the flow as it drips off the roof. He's not allowed to do any of these things. He can just put another device there to try to catch the wine by itself. So here, what's the problem? Obviously, it's the same, it's the same issue, but what's the problem? What is there are we afraid he's going to do if we let him save his property? So the Gemara says the yes answer is that he may bring another vat from somewhere where he has to carry it through, which is a rabbin, which is an answer that I say. He may be so upset about losing his wine that he'll go run and grab another kli from somewhere in order to catch the wine. Okay. The Brisa had said that there is one situation in which you are allowed to catch the wine manually. And that is if you have visitors and you need to be able to feed them wine. But the Bryce says you can't just go catch the wine and then go invite visitors for the wine. You have to either go invite first and then come back and catch it, or if you have visitors that happen to be there. And you also can't play a game. You can't invite visitors that you don't plan on giving wine and then save the wine for them because it's as if you're pretending you're planning to give them the wine. These tricks are sometimes allowed for an Isidar Abana, which is just symbolic, but here it's not allowed. So the Gemara actually brings a machlokas about that. The Tanakama says you can't play this trick, and Rabbi Yossi Barabhuda says you could play the trick. So the Gemara says, well, maybe this is lines up with a similar machlokas about whether or not you're allowed to play tricks on an Esri Dabon and Chavis, and that's as far as Mukta taking an animal who fell into a hole out of the hole. What's the case? Somebody has a mother and a child cow that fell, or some sort of other animal that he wants to shock, that fell into an ant, that fell into a pit on Yantif. Now, the luck is you're allowed to shock on Yantif, but you're only allowed to shock one of them, because you can't shock the mother and its child in the same day. So, which one could you save? You'd like to save both of them, because whichever one you leave there is going to die. So the Gemara says, it's a machok is what you're allowed to do. According to the first opinion, um... 
which is Rabbi Eliezer, you can't uh, save both of them by playing a trick. You can only save one. You take one out of the hole, then you shecht it, and you eat it, which is fine. The other one, you just have to keep feeding while it's in the hole until Yom Tov is over, and then you can fish it out. However, according to Rabbi Yeshua, you're allowed to play a game. What's the game? You take one out, you say, I'm going to shecht this one. Then you look at it and say, oh no, wait, this one looks pretty skinny. Maybe the other one's fatter. Let me take the other one out and shecht that one. And that way you shecht whichever one you want, but you can take both of them out by playing a trick. So the Gemara wants to say, so here you have a machlok is whether or not you're allowed to play tricks, perhaps. That's the same machlok as in our case about whether you're allowed to play tricks in order to invite the guests to save the wine. So the Gemara says, no, that has nothing to do with this. It could be that both of those two opinions would say the opposite halacha in this case. Why? In the case of saving the animal, then the one who says that you're not allowed to play the trick, it could be that's only there because you could still save the animal. How you could feed the animal while well, it's in the hole. Send down food, feed it, you have a way to save it. Here you have no other way to save the wine. In the other opinion, he says that you are allowed to play the trick in order to save the animal. That might be because the animal's in pain. You want to save the pain from the animal. Here you just want to save your wine. Your wine's not suffering. So you have no uh, right to save the wine. Okay, now, going back to the subject of tricks as far as saving food, Umar says, what if you want to play a game in order to save your food from the fire? You want to save bread, and then say, oh, this type of bread is not the type that I want, and I want the other type of bread. So the Bryce says that if you first save good, fine bread, you can't then go save a coarse bread and say, that's better for me. But if you first save the coarse bread, then you could go and save the fine bread and say, that's the type that I need. Now, what about on Yom Kippur, Shabbos, or Yom Tov that are next to each other? So the halach is as follows. On Yom Kippur, on a Friday, you're allowed to save food for Shabbos, because you need it for Shabbos, which is coming up. You won't be able to have food for Shabbos. But if Yom Kippur is on a Sunday, you can't save for Yom Kippur, because you can't eat on Yom Kippur anyway. You won't be able to eat until after Yom Kippur, and then you could go get food, or you could go uh, make food then. Now, from Yom Tov to Shabbos, or Shabbos Yom Tov, certainly you cannot save because... Um, Sorry, from Shabbos to Yom Tov, certainly you can save because you can actually cook on Yom Tov itself, so you could go prepare food for then. Okay, on a similar subject, what if somebody has bread in the oven and Shabbos begins and he forgot to take the bread out of the oven? So the luck is you're not supposed to take bread out of the oven because it's considered to be a chachma. You have to, the breads that they made were stuck to the wall of the oven like a lafa, and you had to scrape them off with a special t- t- tool called the marda. So, what are you allowed to do about this? So, the Gemara says you're only allowed to take off the amount that you need for your meals for Shabbos, because it's already Shabbos. It's not a malacha, but it is a chachma. But you're allowed to call other people and say, you guys come and take whatever bread you need for your meal, and that'll be okay. Now, the Rai says you shouldn't scrape it off with the tool, you should use a knife. So, the Gemara says, why? It's not a malacha. And it says, it's a malacha. This is not a malacha, it's a chachma. So is, the Gemara says, still, you should use a knife because you, you should try to limit the amount of uh, similarity to a malacha that's involved. If, as long as you could use a shina, you should do a shina. Okay, now the Gemara shifts to discuss ways to prepare for Shabbos. Rav Chista says, you should always get up early in the morning on Shabbos in order to get ready for Shabbos. Like it says that the Jews in the Midbar went on the sixth day of the week, on Friday. They prepared what they brought, and they did it right away. That means as soon as they brought it, they went and they prepared it. And when did they go bring it? When did they go collect the man? It says early in the morning they went to collect the man. So you see that they prepared for Shabbos right away early in the morning. You should get up early and start preparing for Shabbos. Next, Rabbi Ava says when you actually make Hamaytzi Friday night or Shabbos day, you should cut two chalas. Well, he says you should cut with two chalas, meaning you have two chalas there. So the rest is a Ravashi. He saw that Rav Kahana didn't cut both. He had two, but he only opened one of them. The rest says that makes a lot of sense, because when it says they collected Lecha Mishnah, twice the amount of bread of the man in the midbar, it doesn't say that they Eight Lecha Mishnah, it says they took Lecha Mishnah. So you have to hold with two loaves in your hand, but you only have to open one of them. Sumara so says that Rabbi Zera used to cut a very large slice. In order for Kavit Shabbos, he cut a big slice that was enough to fill him for the entire meal. Sumara so says Ravina asked Ravashi, that looks like uh, r- 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 ravishment, famishment. It looks like he's starving and he has to eat so much. He said, no, it's not a problem since all week. He doesn't do that way. Only on Shabbos he slices this huge slice. That's obviously clear that he's doing it for the sake of the honor of Shabbos. Okay. Now the Gemara goes to a different subject. The Gemara brings a brisa, which says, how many meals are you supposed to eat on Shabbos? 
So we have the is here between Rav Chidka, who says four meals, and Rav who says three meals. And they both derive their number from the same Pasuk. When Moshe answered the Jews about collecting the man on Shabbos, he said to as follows, Yomer, Moshe, echlu hayom, eat it today, ki Shabbos hayom, Hashem, today is Shabbos for Hashem, hayom, listen to us, today you will find the middle word, today hayom appears three times, to teach you, you need three meals. So Rav says, that's three day meals, not counting the night meals, right? It's from the word hayom, three meals during the day, plus the night meal is four. Um, the Rabbonon, who argue, say that, no, it's, three meals of the entire Shabbos experience, which includes the night meal, and therefore you only have a grand total of three. Tomorrow we'll continue this discussion, but we shall end. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.